Well, good morning, church. Wow, it's a privilege to be here with you today, and I want to thank you and your pastor for the invitation to fill in for him while he is away in Southeast Asia. I've looked forward to this for some time now. And uh, Mark, thank you so very much for that kind introduction. Isn't it amazing what a $100 bill will buy you by way of introduction these days? (laughs) He did a pretty good job with that. I may have to take him with me everywhere I go. Let him him give that introduction. Brother, I do appreciate it so very much. I bring you greetings from the state of Texas. I hope you'll tolerate a Texan in the pulpit here today. I hope that won't be too offensive to you. Several years ago... A preacher came from England to uh, chapel at the seminary where I was teaching. And I'll never forget it. He got up and he said, you know, I love you Texans. Not for who you are, but for who you think you are. (laughs) I thought, boy, that is a great line. That guy knows Texans very well. But nevertheless, I'm delighted to be with you here today. And thank you for the wonderful, wonderful opportunity to uh, have fellowship Uh, with you as we bring the word of the Lord. Would you turn with me to the gospel of Luke? Go to Matthew and turn right two books and you'll come to book number three of four gospels. Luke's gospel. Turn with me to chapter uh, Luke chapter 19 and find your place in verse 1. Luke chapter 19. We're going to read verses 1 through 10 in just a moment. And be my goal to bring an exposition and application of these verses to our lives. Now, I already see it on some of your faces. Some of you are thinking, oh my goodness gracious, the pastor has brought in one of these preaching professors. And I'm sure that he is going to be long-winded. And I'm sure that he will drone on and on and on, and it's just going to be a long, hot, dusty ride through Ulcer Gulch this morning, listening to him preach. Well, now, let hold the phone. Let, let me just allay your fears. As Elizabeth Taylor said to her seventh husband, I won't keep you long, okay? <laughs> so don't worry about that. I want you to get that out of your mind already. Now, when you look at this this passage, before I read it, immediately you look at this text and you look back at me and you say, David, have you lost your mind? Are you crazy? Don't you know this is a Sunday school children's text? Why, we don't preach on this text in big church. This is a children's story. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. And he climbed up into the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. You know the story. But do you know the back story? And do you know the rest of the story? Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but he was not able because of the crowd since he was a short man. So running ahead, he climbed up a sycamore tree to see Jesus since he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, because today it is necessary for me to stay at your house. So he quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, I'll give half of my possessions to the poor, Lord. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus told him, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. 
If I were a travel agent in Israel in the first century in Jesus' day, and you were to come to me and say, David, where would you recommend I take my family on vacation? I would, without hesitation, place into your hands the Jericho brochure. Beautiful Jericho, located 18 and one half miles northeast of Jerusalem. It is a beautiful green oasis in the midst of a brown and barren desert. As you draw near to Jericho, you see the stately palms from a distance. In fact, Jericho is called the city of palms. As you draw even nearer to your left, you see the citrus groves. And then off to your right are the beautiful rose gardens. A very rare, expensive perfume was made from plants that grow only in Jericho. In fact, the name Jericho means perfume. It is a wonderfully beautiful place. It has a remarkable history. Archaeologists tell us that Jericho is the oldest continuously inhabited city on the planet. Scientists tell us that Jericho is the lowest city on the planet, sitting more than 800 feet below sea level. It was a remarkable resort town in Jesus' day. But earlier than that, in 36 B.C., it was owned, that entire territory was owned by Mark Anthony. The great Mark Anthony, the great general, Roman general. And he gave the city of Jericho to his girlfriend as a gift. Her name was Cleopatra. And then after their deaths... The city came under the control of King Herod, and he built a remarkable winter palace there with beautiful colonnades and large buildings and three baths, a cold water, warm water, and hot water bath, a swimming pool the size of a football field. Roman aristocracy would come every winter to vacation in Jericho. But it also has a remarkable Bible history, does it not? Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. It was in Jericho that Elisha the prophet sprinkled salt into the bitter water and God performed a miracle and the bitter water was made sweet. Behind the city of Jericho is the lofty crag of a mountain called the Mount of Temptation where three years earlier Jesus at the inauguration of his public ministry, was led by the Spirit into that mountain to be tested and tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. Beautiful Jericho, last stop on the road to Jerusalem is Jericho. And we are told that Jesus and his disciples were making their way down the lush Jordan Valley From Galilee, up north, traveling southbound to Jericho, where he would spend the night and then make his way the next morning, the 18 miles up the Wadi Kelt, the road to Jerusalem. And there Jesus would spend Saturday night just outside of Jerusalem in Bethany. And then the next morning, he would make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Five days later, would he be crucified Upon a cross, where there would he die for the sins of all of the world. Last stop on the road to Jerusalem is Jericho. And located in Jericho, Dr. Luke tells us, was a man. And there are three details that we are given about old Zacchaeus. Number one, we are told by Dr. Luke that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Now, do not allow that information to go by too quickly. He's not a tax collector. No, no. He is a chief tax collector. He's not an ordinary IRS man. No. He is a chief tax collector. You see, Zacchaeus sat atop a pyramid scheme called tax collecting. The Romans farmed out the job of collecting taxes to all of the world, which they had conquered, to men who were called chief tax collectors 
who would then farm that job out to other underlings called tax collectors. And therefore, Zacchaeus was a Jew who was chosen by the Romans to be the chief tax collector in the entire region. And he lived in Jericho. You see, tax collecting was the hated responsibility that somebody took and the Jews hated and despised the Romans because they collected taxes but they also hated and despised tax collectors because they were their own people who had turned traitor. They had become traitors to the Jewish people viewed by the Jewish people as traitor, traitors and they were the most despicable, ruthless scum of the earth as far as the Jews were concerned. The rabbis preached that no tax collector could go to heaven because he's a traitor to his people. When he died, he goes immediately to hell. The Jewish people viewed tax collectors lower than robbers and murderers. If you saw a tax collector coming down the road, you would go across the road and go up the other side because you did not want to be associated with a tax collector. They were despised. They were hated because they were lining their pockets with the stolen money of their own people. Zacchaeus was a Jayhawk sitting in the bleachers with other Jayhawks and rooting for the Wildcats. He was a traitor. Everybody hated him and despised him because of that. And not only that, number two, he was rich. Luke tells us he was rich. Yes, he was, because he had stolen money, extorted money from people, because the Romans permitted a chief tax collector, not only to collect the required taxes, but then to add a little extra and skim off the top from the people, if he could get away with it, in order to line his own pockets. And that's exactly what Zacchaeus had done. And because of that, he was absolutely despised and hated. The Jewish Mishnah, which is the commentary on the Old Testament law, taught that you could lie to a tax collector when he came to your door about your assets in order to protect your own assets from him because he's going to cheat you every way that he can. And so here is old Zacchaeus, he's chief tax collector. And taxes were collected in three places in Jesus' day in Israel. They were collected in Jerusalem, they were collected in Capernaum, and they were collected in Jericho. And here is Zacchaeus, he sits atop one of the big three. He's the kingpin of the Jericho tax cartel. And so because of that, he is rich. But then the third detail, which is key to the story. Luke tells us he was a short man. Now let's stop for a moment and think about that. He was a short man. How short? I did a little research sociologically on males, the height, the average height of males in Israel in the first century in Jesus' day. And you know what I discovered? The average height of a Jewish male in the first century in Jesus' day was 5 feet 6 inches tall. Now, take a good look at me. I am 5 feet 6 inches tall. In American culture, I am a short man because the average height of an American male is five feet nine inches tall. Let me prove it to you. Every man in this room, if you are taller than five feet six inches, taller than five six, raise your hand. All right, hold them up. Now just look around, everybody. Look around. Most of the men in this room have raised their hands because the average height of an American male is five nine. And so I, in American culture, am considered a short man. But if the average height in Israel, in Zacchaeus' day, was 5'6", and yet the Bible says he was a short man, he must have been considerably shorter than 5 feet 6 inches tall. If I were casting for Zacchaeus the movie, do you know who I would cast? Danny DeVito. 
a little short, sawed-off, slimy social scoundrel with a big bank account and an Armani suit. I think he would fit the bill nicely, don't you? And so here's old Zach, and he's a chief tax collector. He's rich, he's short, and he's hated by everyone. One day Jesus came to town. I want you to know when, Je- when word spread that Jesus is about to enter the city and he's passing through and he'll spend the night before he goes toward Jerusalem the next morning. I want you to know this was the biggest thing to hit Jericho since I don't know when. I mean it was like Elvis and Princess Diana and Michael Jackson all came to Jericho on the same day. And everybody, I mean everybody, fled their homes and businesses and schools and playgrounds and everywhere else in order to converge in the downtown area to get a glimpse of Jesus as he passed by. I mean, there were gray beards on crutches and babies in mother's arms and everybody else 10 feet deep pushing, pulling, shoving, jostling, trying to get a place where they could see Jesus. Well, Zacchaeus was just as curious as everyone else. He had heard about Jesus, and he wanted to see him. What does he look like? And he tried to get through the crowd, but he couldn't because he was a short man. But being the unscrupulous entrepreneur that he was, old Zacchaeus knows that down the road where Jesus will have to pass in a moment is the ficus sycamorus. The sycamore tree, which is a tree that has a large round trunk, grows to about 40 feet in height, and has limbs that grow out almost parallel to the ground. And the first limbs are very low to the ground already on the trunk. And therefore, the sycamore tree is one of the easiest trees to climb. And so can't you see him? He hurries down ahead of the crowd, and he scampers up that tree with the alacrity of a monkey, and he finds his perch right there on the limb overlooking Main Street where Jesus will pass by. I mean, he's got the best seat in the house. He is on the 50-yard line. He is right behind home plate. He has the best seat in all of the house. And there comes Jesus, and as he passes by, suddenly Jesus stops. And he looks up, and he says, I kiss You come down out of that tree. Today, I must stay at your house. Can you imagine the shock on Zacchaeus' face? How does this man know my name? I've never met him before. How is it that he's calling my name? And not only that, he's inviting himself to come stay in my house. Why, Zacchaeus could not have been more shocked if the tree itself had called out his name. Zacchaeus, you come down today. I must stay at your house. You know, this tells me something about Jesus. It tells me that he is blind to something. Jesus is blind to crowds. He only sees individuals. Jesus doesn't see the crowds. He sees Bill and Susan and Tom and Mary and John and Jennifer. He doesn't see the crowds. He only sees individuals. I guess you come down. Today I must stay at your house. You know, some of you may be here today, you think, well, Jesus has got a big job running the universe. I don't think he has much time to be concerned about me and my problems. Oh, how wrong you are. Well, you see, the Bible says that even the very hairs of your head are numbered. God knows all about you, and He knows your name. And among the crowd, does He call your name like He called Zacchaeus, inviting 
himself to come and be with you and fellowship with you and you to come and be with him. Zacchaeus, you come down today. I must stay. It's a divine appointment, Zacchaeus. Today, I must stay at your house. Jesus asking hospitality from Zacchaeus. And the interesting thing is, we're told right there in verse 6, so he quickly came down and welcomed Jesus joyfully. Lord, you may have my home. You may stay in my home. I will give you hospitality. You know something else I thought about? Think about this. 1,400 years earlier from this event, Two men came into this same city of Jericho. They were spies. And they came in in order to spy out the land before the nation of Israel under Joshua were going to come and destroy Jericho. And they came to the house of a woman who, like Zacchaeus, was not exactly the most upstanding citizen in Jericho. In fact, Rahab was a prostitute. She lived in the red light district and ran a house of prostitution. And that's where they stayed. But the remarkable thing is Rahab was a woman of amazing faith. And she said to those spies, we've heard about your God and we know he's going to destroy our city. And therefore, when you come and your armies come, remember me and my family. Protect me. And they made a promise to her that they would. And you remember when the armies encamped around Jericho and marched around the city and the walls came tumbling down and the city was taken. You remember Rahab was spared. Do you know the rest of her story? She became an Israeli. She became an Israelite. And she married an Israelite man, and they had a son whom you might have heard of. His name was Boaz. And Boaz also, like his mama, married a foreign girl whose name was Ruth, and they had a child. Their child grew and married and had a child, and that child grew, married and had a child, that child grew, married and had a child, and the child born as a descendant of Boaz and Ruth, a descendant of Rahab, was King David. And David, as you know, is the key to the line of the Messiah. So one day, a young girl who was a virgin named Mary, but was pregnant miraculously by the Holy Spirit, who was from that genealogy line of David. And her husband, Joseph, who was from that same genealogical line of David, came to the city of Bethlehem and gave birth to Jesus, the Son of God. Watch it. And now, Jesus, the descendant of Rahab, comes back to Jericho and asks for hospitality 1,400 years later. So I guess you come down. Today I must stay at your house. Lord, Please, thank you, come, I welcome you, you are welcome in my home. He quickly came down and welcomed him joyfully. Oh, but there is verse 7. Look at it. All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. (laughs) I can just see it, can't you? This, by the way, is how we know that most of the people who lived in Jericho were Baptists. (laughs) All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. I can see two old boys there in the crowd. One man turns to the other, pokes him in the the side and says, "Uh Aha, there you have it. What did I tell you? Uh Aha, that's the way it is. Those preachers preach about about the poor, but they dine with the rich. Yeah, I know how that works. Uh huh. 
All of Jericho snickered up their sleeves to think that Jesus didn't have any better sense than to invite himself into the home of the worst sinner in town, the person who nobody else would touch with a ten-foot pole. Can you believe that Jesus invited himself to stay in the home of that piece of scum, that sinner Zacchaeus? Can you believe that Jesus would invite himself to stay in that home and that he would even talk to that piece of scum, that sorry sinner Zacchaeus? Can you believe she wore that in our church today? Can you believe he said that in our church today? Can you believe those people of a different color than we are came into our church today? The clipboard committee. Every church has one. The clipboard committee. Now, I know I'm the visiting preacher today. But would you allow me to make a suggestion? If you are on the clipboard committee... Why don't you resign today? And in fact, may I make another suggestion? Why don't you just disband the clipboard committee today? All who saw it began to complain. He's gone to stay with a sinful man. Have you ever noticed how sometimes Jesus is more concerned about the worst sinners in our town than we are? How he is more concerned about their soul than those of us who are church people are. Well, he's gone to stay with a sinful man. But Luke continues in verse 8. But Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look. I'll give half my possession to the poor Lord, and if I've extorted anything from anyone, I'll pay back four times as much. Zacchaeus realized he had done too much bad and not enough good, and he wanted to rectify both situations. And now that he's come in contact with Jesus, and now that he has been saved by the grace of God through Christ Jesus. And oh yes, he is saved. Jesus affirms in the next verse, today salvation came to this house. And so here is old Zach. He's a new believer now. He's a new Christian now. And his life is changed and he does two things to demonstrate his changed life. Number one, he said, look, don't let that word go by too quickly. That's just a word that means, hey, get ready for something really unusual that's about to happen or about to be said. Lord, look. It's kind of like my grandmother when something odd or unusual would happen. She would say, well, looky here. This is the same kind of idiom. Now, looky here. I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor, Lord. If you were a Jew in the first century and you gave 20% of your income to the poor, you were somebody. I mean, you got your name in the church bulletin. Actually, in the synagogue bulletin, you got your name. Now, I want to just do a little survey today. I'm going to start over here on the left. 
And here's my survey question. How many of you right here, seated right here, you give 50% of your annual income to the poor? I want you to raise your hand. Let me see. Okay? How about right here, all the way to the back? How many of you give 50% of your income every year to the poor? I want you to raise your hand. Okay? How about right here, all the way to the back? Including those sound boys way back there. All right, cameraman too. How many of you give 50% of your income annually to the poor? Raise your hand. Let me see. Okay. How about over here? You give 50% of your income to the poor. Raise your hand. Uh Uh-huh. Neither do I. But Zacchaeus did. Because, ladies and gentlemen, when you come in contact with Jesus Christ, and when He saves you from your sins, He changes your life. And there's a changed life that results. And Zacchaeus is demonstrating that he is a believer in Christ. He's been saved by the blood of Christ because he said, Lord, I'm going to give 50% of my income to the poor. And not only that. Number two, Lord, if I've extorted anything from anyone, you know he had. If I've extorted anything from anyone, I'm going to pay back four times as much. (laughs) You talk about tax reform. (laughs) Yeah, That's the day tax reform came to the city of Jericho. Four times as much. Why four times as much? Because Zacchaeus knew that in the book of Exodus, the law says... If you steal from your neighbor, you pay back four times as much. And so he he said, Lord, I, I know the scripture says that I pay back four times what I've stolen. So Lord, tell them to take a number and get in line. If I've extorted anything from any of you, take a number and get in line. I'm going to pay back four times what I took from you. Can you imagine? Wow, what that must have been like in the city of Jericho that day. And then Jesus said in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house, he told him, for he too is a son of Abraham. Jesus verified that old Zacchaeus had been truly converted. Today salvation has come to this house. And then Jesus makes the odd statement, for he too is a son of Abraham. You see, the Jews prided themselves on being sons of Abraham. They were were the chosen people. This makes us special. You know, all the rest of you Gentile dogs, y'all are nobody. We are God's special chosen people. This was the Jewish attitude of pride which they possessed. But you see, the Jews of Jericho had booted out Zacchaeus because he's a traitor to the Romans. And therefore they have said, no, you're no longer a Jew. But Jesus said, now hold the phone. (laughs) He too is a son of Abraham. And then comes the most important verse in the story. Verse 10. Lean in and listen closely. For the Son of Man has come to seek And to save the lost. Fourteen monosyllables. Not a single one. Not a single word more than four letters long. And yet encapsulated right here is all of the New Testament. All of the ministry of Jesus. All of the mission of Jesus. And all of the message of Jesus. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. Son of Man. Where does that terminology come from? Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. In fact, it is his favorite designation for himself in all four Gospels. More than any other name does Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man. What does that mean? And from where did it come? I'm glad you asked. It comes from Daniel chapter 7, where there is a prophecy given to Daniel, a vision given to Daniel, and Daniel sees the Ancient of Days, and the Ancient of Days is none other than God Himself. And coming to stand before the Ancient of Days is one like the Son of Man. 
And the description of him is, he is given power and riches and glory and honor. And he shall reign forever and ever. That son of man is Jesus Christ. Prophesied hundreds of years before from, by Daniel. And Jesus says, I am the son of man. I am that man. I am who Daniel prophesied. I am the one who has come to be the savior of all people. Jesus didn't say he's the son of Abraham, though he is. That would be a racial limitation. He didn't say he's the son of David, though he is. That would be a kingly royal limitation. He did not say I'm the son of Mary, though indeed he is. That would be a family limitation. No, he says he is the son of man. He's the son of no nation because he's the savior of all the nations. I, the son of man, have come to seek and to save the lost. Lost, it's a harsh word. Lost, it's a dark word. Lost, lost dog, lost ship, lost son, lost. What better word to describe the spiritual condition of people who do not know Christ as Savior than this word. It's Jesus' favorite word to describe the condition of all people who do not know Him. Lost, separated from God. Lost, headed for an eternal hell. Lost. There are two kinds of lost. There's lost beyond recovery. If your house burns down, it's lost. Lost beyond recovery. You may build another house. But that house is lost beyond recovery. Oh, but there's another kind of lost. Lost and found. Have you ever lost an article of clothing? Or an article like a Bible or an umbrella or something? And then a day, two days, a week, a month later you found it? Well, of course you have. Everybody's done that. Lost and found. And Jesus is a lost and found kind of Savior. If you turn left... From Luke 19, four chapters, you come to Luke 15. And in Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three stories about lost things. He says there was a shepherd had a hundred sheep. One of them wandered away and got lost. He left the ninety and nine alone, the ninety-nine, and he searched for that lost sheep till he found him. And then he put him on his shoulders and he brought him safely back to the fold. And he said, this my sheep was lost, but now he is found. And a woman had ten coins. And she lost one of them. What did she do? She moved every stick of furniture and she took her broom and she searched in every nook and cranny of her house until she found the lost coin. Then she rejoiced. And she said, my coin was lost, but now it's found. A father had two sons. One of them said, Dad, give me my inheritance. And then he took that money and went off into the far country of sin. And he wasted it in wild living. And then he was destitute and had nothing. And all the friends left. And he found himself working in the hog pen. And he was starving. And he came to himself and he said, My dad's servants are better off than I am. I'm going to go home and I'm going to ask dad to forgive me. And I know you won't take me back as a son, but just let me be a servant in the house. But when he was a great way off, Jesus told, told the story. The father saw him, ran, and threw his arms around him and said, Welcome home, son. We're going to have a party. And you remember what the father said. This my son was dead, but he is alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. You see, it doesn't matter who you are. However far down the totem pole of sin, your own. However evil, wicked you may have been like Zacchaeus. Jesus is the hound of heaven on your trail. He is the one seeking you. You're not seeking him. But he's seeking you. He's the one who desires your salvation. He's the Son of Man who's come to seek and to save the lost. 
And it doesn't matter whether you're the lost millionaire or the lost monarch, whether you're the lost prostitute or the lost prodigal, whether you're the lost scholar or the lost skeptic, it matters not. He is seeking your salvation. He is desiring you to repent of your sin and come to Him and be saved. He is the Son of Man who seeks and seeks to save the lost. Last stop. On the road to Jerusalem is Jericho. There Jesus met a man up in a tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down from that tree. Because next week I will be lifted up on a tree. Called a cross at Calvary's Hill. And there will I die for your sins and the sins of all the people of Jericho and Israel. And all of the people of the world. Zacchaeus, you come down. It's a divine appointment. Come down from that tree. One week from today will I be lifted up on a tree. Lifted up on the cross to pay for your sins and mine. Last stop on the road to Jerusalem is Jericho. And now you know the rest of the story. Because you see, you are the rest of the story. Jesus' mission is your mission. Jesus' purpose is your purpose. His message is your message. He's the Son of Man who's come to seek and to save the lost. From now the rest of your life until the Lord takes you home, your job is to join hands with Him and get the good news to every person in this city, this state, this country, and this world that the Son of Man, Jesus, has come to save the lost. That's what this church is all about. That's why you exist. This is the purpose of your individual Christian life, that you may glorify Him by being on mission to bring people to Christ. Last stop on the road to Jerusalem is Jericho. And there Jesus met a man in a tree who needed Him. And so, you are the rest of the story. Let's get the gospel to everybody we can. Because no one is beyond the love and grace of God. And oh yeah, by the way, in the process. Don't forget about the men in trees. We come to a time of response, of invitation, because every sermon is a call from the Word of God to you to respond. And so in a moment as I pray, we're going to stand, and others will be here at the front to receive you. And you may be watching me right now on video, right now on live stream, right now on the internet. And you need Christ as your Savior. Wonderful news, He's come for you. He died for you. He rose again for you. He is in heaven today. He's the hound of heaven on your trail. If you will repent of your sin and by faith believe in Jesus, do it today. Church family, most of you are saved, but some of you don't know Christ. In a crowd this size, I guarantee you there are four or five at least people who are here who don't know Jesus. Would you receive Him today? Would you, like Zacchaeus, welcome Him with open arms into your heart today? I encourage you, I invite you to do so. There'll be pastors here at the front just come and say, you know what, I want to be saved. I need Christ. And they'll pray with you and lead you to the Lord Jesus. Most of you, though, are church members. And there's a prayer altar. We're going to invent one on all these empty chairs on the front. If you want to come, you don't necessarily have to talk to one of the pastors here. Just maybe kneel and say, Lord, restore me to be on mission with you. For the rest of my days. Because you are the son of man who's come to seek and to save the lost. I'm going to pray. We're going to stand. And we're going to do business with God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful account of Jesus and Zacchaeus. And Lord, the power of the gospel and your power to save and change lives. Lord, speak to everyone and may everyone make the decision you call them to make, even now, Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand? Stand with me all over the building. 
There are counselors and others down here ready to receive you right now. Would you come? Would you do it while they sing? Right now, you come.